There is something so powerful and meaningful and special about Christmas carols. And the reason this time of year is one of my favorites is because this is the time of year we get to sing all about the birth of our Savior. I hope you enjoyed that time of worship as much as I did.
I'm Pastor Diane Jones, and I just am here to share with you a little bit more about what's coming up for the rest of December. We are in the middle of our Advent season, and we've had some great Sundays so far. Uh, coming up next Sunday, the 19th, a big, big week for all of our students, all the way from preschool up through 12th grade. Uh, our kids' crazy Christmas party will be happening Sunday the 19th during the service, during our regular kids' time. And so that's, again, preschool to fifth grade, we'll be having Kids Crazy Christmas, and this year it's all about Christmas PJs and Pop-Tarts. So don't miss, bring your kids here on the 19th for an awesome time. And then that same Sunday the 19th at 6 o'clock, our youth is having their Christmas party as well. So that's for students from 6th grade up and through uh, 12th grade. Uh, and so don't let your students, your middle schoolers and high schoolers, miss what's going to be an incredible time at One Youth at 6 o'clock. And then coming up, December 24th, our Christmas Eve service. Now, I wanna let you know, especially all of you online, that this is going to be an exclusively in-person event. But we do have two times for you to catch it with us. So Christmas Eve, our services will be at 3.30 in the afternoon and at five o'clock in the evening. And we planned a special, incredible, worshipful time, again, just to concentrate and to celebrate the birth of Jesus, our Savior. So I hope if you're able, you actually do join us for that in-person experience that'll be here at the church at 3.30 and at five o'clock on Christmas Eve. And that pretty much does it for the year. After our Christmas Eve service, you get to celebrate Christmas with your families at home on Saturday. And then on Sunday, the 26th, you are able to have Thrive at Home that day. A time for you to just reconnect with your family, decompress from a busy Christmas season, and just get ready for the new year. So on December 26th, there will be no in-person services. We'll be doing our Thrive at Home with a guide that you kind of read through and discuss and share with your family, as well as an online uh, experience to share as well. So December 19th, Kids Crazy Christmas, don't miss our Christmas Eve service on the 24th at 3.30 and at 5, and then the 26th, Thrive at Home. Now, as I mentioned before, we are in the middle of our Advent season. We've been reading, I hope you have as well, the story of Jotham's journey, which has been incredibly interesting. Even though it's a kid's story, I get really into it every day. And now we're gonna hear from Pastor Andy again as we continue Unwrapping Christmas. Isn't that what you asked for? No, I asked for your toy. Hopefully they got it right. I don't know ponies, they're for girls. Guys, Mine you... is a stupid book. He got the best out of the war! <laughs> no fair! Those things went up for Santa Claus! Gift giving has become a central part of Christmas. I mean, the focus that we put on presents that are under the tree, kids making lists, going to Santa and asking him for what we want most is such a big part of Christmas time. I mean, we really sort of play into this now and you hear about it and you see it everywhere. In the United States this year, it's estimated that people will spend one trillion dollars on Christmas. But what's interesting about the gifts that we give is honestly most gifts are expected. Now you might go, well, no, no, that's not really true. It really is. Really is it that we get a gift, a gift that we're surprised by, that's unexpected, that we're not sure is coming? We'll give out the obligatory shirts or pants or sweaters. I mean, growing up, 
I don't know why this was, but, but my mom, hi mom, my mom would literally get into this kind of mode for a long time. And I think we had kind of a couple of lean years where it got started, but my mom just kept doing it, where my mom would just give us like socks. And I'm not, this all started in the 80s. I'm talking about the 1980s tube socks. If you're old enough, you know what I'm talking about. The white socks with kind of the couple of bands around that you pull up high. Yeah, my mom would give those, and like every year, we would know underneath the tree which of the presents was socks. It was just like we knew what was coming. And, and people, uh, I think, have gotten to that place where we sort of can even not expect the unexpected. This is literally, we know what is coming. People will even go out, I've heard this, and go buy gifts for themselves, give them to somebody, have them wrap them and put them under the tree so they can unwrap them on Christmas Day. You throw in gift cards and how commonplace those things are and how easy, quite honestly, they are to spot. And they are even more expected than what you may realize. See, we've not really gotten this whole gift giving thing down very well. A gift should have some element of surprise to it. It should be unknown. It should be unexpected in terms of what's actually being given, that actually puts it on a level of a gift that stands out, that's memorable, that you can think of. I mean, when you can surprise somebody with the gift that you give them that they're not expecting, it goes beyond kind of what they're thinking could even be possible for you to give. And you know what? You actually touch something inside them that is powerful. This happened for us for a number of years ago. The family uh, and I went away on a trip and we were gone and when we came back, it was late at night, and we're driving up, and we drive up to the house, and it was kind of, you know, a little bit, you know, in the early evening, and we look up at the front of the house, and we're like, something's just not right. Like, something's different that's going on there, and you start looking, and you start examining what's going on, and you're like, wait a minute, that grass looks a lot greener than what it normally does, and then you look up, too, and then there was some, like, plants that were up along the kind of the planter area next to the garage going towards the front door, and Somebody had come and actually redone our entire front yard. I mean, Sally and I were blown away when we finally started to have it sink in. We started to recognize what was going on. We couldn't believe it. Our yard was just in kind of rough shape and for a different variety of reasons. And Sally and I are not exactly green thumb kind of people. But our yard was redone. People had come and put in new sod and they fixed the sprinklers to kind of go along with it. And, and they fixed uh, some concrete in terms of the walkway that had gotten pitched up because of a tree root going underneath. And they planted a bunch of really cool bushes and some plants along the side. And it just looked amazing. And we had no idea what was happening. It was done by a group of thrivers uh, here from the church. And it was amazing. It was truly incredible because it was unexpected. We didn't know it was coming, but it truly was memorable and thoughtful and had a huge impact on us. I mean, to have friends that want to just come and bless you and help you is completely amazing, the feeling that you get inside. I think all of us probably, hopefully, have had some kind of gift that we've received in that way. Maybe it was something handmade or something special that somebody did for you. Or maybe it was some sort of generous gift that somebody gave that you didn't expect. Maybe it was a heartfelt, meaningful one. Maybe it was just honestly some words that someone spoke to you at the appropriate time that really just kind of touched your soul in a big way. Whatever it was, when you receive something unexpected like that, it can be absolutely incredible to your soul. Unexpected gifts are amazing. But here's the thing, though. It's only amazing if you recognize the gift that is given. It's only recognized if you recognize what it is that you actually have when someone gives you something unexpected. Sometimes we can get something and we don't even fully grasp what it is that we have been given. Back in the, the 80s, Sally uh, kind of loved clothes and fashion and when she was in high school. And it was during her time in high school when a pair of shoes came out uh, that were probably some of the most, would become one of some of the most iconic shoes ever. Uh, they were Air Jordans, the original, very first Jordans to come out, the original black and red and white high tops. And Sally had a pair. 
Uh, and that's kind of a nice story, but fast forward to uh, just last year, we're having a conversation with our son, and Creighton's kind of gotten into shoes a little bit, and he's kind of like a, just a tiny little bit of a sneaker head, like in some of the things that are out there today. And so he knows about StockX and some of the different sites and apps you can get to to check out shoes. And we were talking about things, and he was like, Dad, yeah, Jordans, you know, they're, the original Jordans are like, would be going for so much. And I stopped for a second because I went back to this story, and Sally was able to tell him, she's like, you know what, I had a pair of those, Creighton. And Creighton's like, what? Oh my gosh, you had an original pair of Jordans? She's like, yeah. She said, I had them. She goes, maybe I wore them like three times, but I didn't like them very much. So I went and I donated them to Goodwill. Creighton loses his mind when he's sitting there in the kitchen. He's like, you did what? He's like, do you know that used on the market right now, those shoes, even if they're in okay shape, probably could go for like $20,000. Sally had no idea what she had back then, and, and who would? You didn't realize that that would be something that would hold its value in what Jordan would do. But sometimes, I think in our lives, we miss out on what gifts actually really make the most impact. Sometimes when we receive something from someone that really has some meaning behind it, behind it we, we, we don't even recognize what we have. We've missed the heart behind some of the most unexpected, under-realized, under-utilized gifts that we've been given, been given to God and to those around us. See, this idea of this, the unexpected gift really is something that we see in the Christmas story. And there's some people who understood this that we're going to look at today. That they didn't really fully realize what it was that they were giving and what they were receiving. But they gave an unexpected gift that had would have an impact far beyond what they would know. And I think the power behind that is that it has impact. That's really what gifts are for, is to convey uh, a, a meaning, convey uh, importance, convey love, convey that we really care about someone that we are extending this gift to. And I think we need to unwrap this idea of this gift and how we actually receive and give this time of year. It's why we're unwrapping this idea today about the unexpected gift and what exactly we can learn because there's a gift that we don't realize that can have a powerful impact. But the story of Christmas and the story of the very first Christmas, we get to see a couple of people demonstrate just what the power of that is all about. And so let's jump in, thrive, and let's open our Bibles. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 2, and discover just what this unexpected gift was that was given. Uh, Matthew chapter 2 actually uh, is entitled Visitors from the East. This is the story of the wise men, and this is what it says. I'm going to read from verse 1 all the way down through verse 12. It says, Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Then Herod called a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when that star first appeared. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem, search carefully for the child, and when you find him, come back to me and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went their way. And the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. This part of the Christmas story in the Bible is where we are introduced to what's known as the wise men, maybe other translations call them the magi. Really, these 
Wise men were astronomers, you know, magi coming from that word magician. They were people that were scientists, but also had religion that was interwoven within the way that they viewed the world. So they combined astronomy and religion together to try to foresee events. They were often very wealthy, highly educated men who acted as advisors to kings. Tradition, as you probably can imagine, has their number set at three. Why is that? Because that's the number that comes with the nativity sets that we put out at Christmas time. But the truth is, as we're going to see in a little bit, there probably was a lot more people that showed up in Bethlehem that day. So the passage describes what happens. The passage tells us in that moment that, that the star shows up the day that Jesus is born, right? So this celestial light emerges, it comes out, and it's completely out of the ordinary. There's something completely different and divine about this star that comes at the time of Jesus' birth. And so these men, these wise men from the east, see this star, and they are compelled, and they are just kind of urged and moved with inside of themselves to go, we need to discover the origins and what this is all about. Now part of what would have led them to kind of seek out this journey actually comes from the, probably an understanding that there were some, probably some Jews that lived in the area where they were from. These men love to study and they love to learn about different religions and different groups of people. So they probably had access to some of the Old Testament writings that would have foretold about this king that would be born and that there would be some foreshadowings of things to help guide them to them. So you put this all together. They see the divine light. They went and they started to research it and discover and they figure out that the star actually was going to be in Palestine and they go, we want to follow this to see what happens. So they start planning to move out in the star. Now, the estimates are that they traveled approximately eight to 900 miles, which would be about from where I am right now in Vacaville and if we traveled to like Wyoming. Uh, so they set out and they begin on their journey uh, to head towards Palestine. And as they get closer, they just naturally think, where are you going to go? If you're going to see a king that was born, you don't have to think too hard. You'd go to the capital city because you imagine he's going to be born in the palace. You imagine there'd be something that would be swirling around the political center of the area. And so they go to Jerusalem. And anytime you go into a major city, especially with their breeding and background, you would go seek an audience of the man who was in charge. And at the time, it was King Herod. He was the acting king, sort of the prefect in charge that the Roman government had put in place at the time. And so they find an audience with King Herod. They show up. They kind of tell him the story. And they're like, hey, we're here to worship the king that has been born. And Herod is ticked. I mean, Herod's upset, and you can sort of understand why, because he's got the title king, and yet they're coming with some other king, and he is going, you know what, no one's taken my throne from me. So he calls in the religious leaders, his, the teachers, kind of the educated elite uh, when it comes to religious matters. They begin to understand, and he goes, okay, where is this king supposed to be born, guys? Kind of hit me up, let me know. And they tell him he's supposed to be born in Bethlehem. Now, Bethlehem was only six miles away from Jerusalem, about south uh, southwest. So Herod, he's shrewd. He understands what's going on. And so he says, you know what, guys? Uh, I would love to worship this king that's been born too. Would you guys travel, go find where he is in Bethlehem, discover what he's all about, and then report back to me? Of course, Herod had very different motives and reasons behind the whole thing. So the wise men head off, the star is there, and it leads them just to Bethlehem, and it parks right over the house where Mary and Joseph and toddler Jesus is. And this is where the Bible tells us they had some incredible joy flood their souls. And there was something about this baby that was totally different than what they'd anticipated or expected. They could feel it. They could sense it. And while they couldn't know who Jesus fully was, they, they just couldn't get there yet. They had to, and what the Bible says, they had to get down on their knees and bow to him and to worship him. And they come, of course, bearing gifts, because that's what you do for a king. Uh, so they had some things that they put together, not knowing exactly what. But they present these gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They stay there for a little while. God tells them in a dream, go home by another route. And they take off back to where they're from. Now you start to think, that's the story. It kind of gives us a, an understanding of where these men came from 
why they sort of began to show up and what drew them there. But I think ultimately the wise men, they would have been a huge surprise to Mary and Joseph. They, they weren't expected when they knocked on the door. It would have completely taken them off guard to go and open that. And all of a sudden there is this, not just three guys, there is an entourage of people outside their door coming to see Jesus. And while we have the tendency to focus on the three gifts that they brought, again, not expected, not anticipated, what we're going to see is that the real gift was something that they would cherish that would last with them much longer, had the biggest impact on them, and we're going to see that it actually had a huge impact on the wise men as well. See, after traveling such a long way, this encounter that took place was more than Mary and Joseph could have hoped for. It was just a gift. It was a gift to them, and it was an unexpected gift. See, neither the wise men nor Mary or Joseph could have anticipated the impact of this. See, that's the power of presence. I'm not talking about presence like the gifts that you give. I'm talking about the presence of being together with someone. See, when you're with and in someone's presence, you're connected with them. You're, you're on the same page as them. You're relating, enjoying the company, the interaction, the camaraderie that comes from that. And that's powerful when you experience something meaningful and deep. And especially when you travel such a long way and you've got so much invested in it that you're so looking forward to it. And there's a divine nature to what you're about to experience it's divine for Mary and Joseph because of what they've gone through to have this child that's from God and for these wise men to follow a star that led them to this place. God is clearly behind this. See, that's the power of presence. And then joy is a natural consequence that comes from it. See, when you're not expecting something and you get this incredible gift of presence, it is like nothing else ever. There's a commercial that I came across a number of years ago from Ikea. Uh, and Ikea in Spain uh, put out this commercial that got a bunch of kids together and sat them down and said, hey, here's a piece of paper. Write down a list of all of the things that you'd like to get from Santa Claus. Their version of it actually is called the Three Kings. Uh, it's a little different, but it's their version of Santa Claus. Say, hey, what do you want to get from the Three Kings? And so they go down and they write down their list. And they actually, the one little girl's got a catalog and she's like, I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this. Total classic where kids are at, right? Those are those things. Then they gave them another sheet of paper and said, hey, would you write down what's something that you would like from your mom and your dad? And the kids, you know, took a second. It's like, yeah, what would you like? What would you like from your mom and your dad? And it was fascinating, uh, some of the things that the kids wrote down. And so uh, the people from Ikea presented these to the parents of the kids who were participating. And of course, they looked at the one list and went, yep, no doubt, no doubt. They want all these different things off the list. Then they showed them the list that they said about some of the things that they wished that they would get from their parents. It was really radically different. Like, I would love for you to play soccer with me. I would love for you to spend the day with me. I would love to just talk with you more. I would love for us to eat dinner together more often. I mean, these are some of the things that are on the list that these kids were asking for. And of course, parents start to tear up and there's some moving things. You're like, oh, that's pretty sweet. But then sort of the moment happens later. They go back to the kids and say, hey, if you could only give one of these lists and have one of these lists be the one that actually comes true and you get those gifts that you wrote down, which list would you choose? The one from Santa or Three Kings or the one from your parents? And the kids sat there for a second and all of a sudden you see these kids start going, I'd like the gift for my parents. I'd like the gift for my mom. I'd like the gift for my parents. See, all those things that they mentioned that they wanted were actually gifts that were about being together. It was about the presence that we have with one another. So that's how powerful presence is. See, the wise men coming in that moment and knocking on the door when Mary and Joseph opened it was an unexpected gift of presence for Mary and Joseph. I mean, the wise men being there to meet Jesus and to be in Jesus' presence, to be in the presence of God himself was an unexpected gift for them. See, the unexpected gift of presence is the best present. I think we know this. When you go home to see family that you haven't seen in a long time, maybe being together is an incredible gift. And maybe when you 
reconnect and, and you get to go see an old friend that you haven't seen in a while that you just kind of know and you start connecting and talking to. It is such an incredible gift that you have when you find time with someone that you love. And it's just the two of you. You have a chance to connect. Or as a family, you get to connect and you haven't in a long time. It truly is special. But sometimes and somehow we've gotten to this place especially this time of year where we've kind of fallen into this rough rut of getting gifts or just giving to give or spending more than we have so we've got a lot of presents under the tree as if more is better. See, when we do this, we're actually sabotaging our souls. And they begin to shrink a little bit in terms of the message and meaning of what God meant for this time of year to have in our lives and what he wants us to feel. It's why we want to unwrap This unexpected gift of presence so that we can move closer to the heart of why Christ came to earth and why it matters. Now, before you think somehow I'm like anti-gift giving, you know, don't do that. I love presents. I love getting gifts. If you want to get me one for Christmas, I would absolutely love that. But what really speaks to our soul isn't that kind of gift or present. It's actually the presence that we have with the people around us. See, we love Truly, when you think about it, when you got that gift that was really thoughtful, maybe something special that someone went out of their way to do, someone that's taken time for you, when maybe there's a real generosity behind something that has no expectation behind it, but it's just there, uh, just freely given to you. See, it's not how much we spend that matters. It's what we give, and there's a big difference. Now, I know maybe you've already gotten a lot of your shopping done, Uh, but it's not too late to give presents to. See, one of the reasons why this is so valuable and what we see in the story is that the unexpected gift of presents makes people the priority. See, when the wise men saw the star that was up there, it wasn't like they booked a ticket, packed the carry-on, headed to the airport, and were at their destination, and it was just quick and easy. You know, I got my ticket on Expedia, and we are good to go. No, it was way more than that. No, they had to organize. They had to like, they had to research like, what's this star? What's significance? Do we know anything about it? So they had to discover. And then they were like, hey, we're going to go see this because it's that big of a deal. So then all of a sudden they go into kind of planning mode of, okay, where might we go? Because they had no idea. They were just following a star. They didn't know, okay, get on 80 and drive to this exit and kind of get off and go that way. They didn't have, the star was the GPS back in the day. So they got a plan for the unexpected on the journey. And so they're like, okay, we got to get supplies and we got to get a team together and we got to rent, you know, we got to go to the rental camel place and make sure we put our reservation in to get all the things that we need. And they're going through all this prep and organization and preparing, thinking through like, what do we got to bring? I mean, imagine when you go on a camping trip, for those of you who like to camp, and all this stuff that you've got to get together to just go away for a week. Imagine going, we don't know how long this is going to take. We don't know how far we're going to have to go. This is the commitment and the intentionality behind what it was that they were doing. And then they brought this variety of actual gifts that they were going to present to this king upon when they got there in the end. But you know what was the best thing of all of those things? All added up to them giving the greatest thing that they could have given. They showed up. They were actually there. They didn't let anything stop them from going and actually meeting Jesus and his parents I mean, the new king was the priority. He was what mattered. The focus was on him and all of the preparations that they had gone through. See, sometimes our eyes shift away from the person that we're actually getting gifts for. And we just kind of get something so we can cross it off our list and say we got them something. You know, sometimes we don't even take the time to think it through. Like, oh, let's just get him a gift card. Or, oh, let's just get him this. The minute you start going down that path, you sort of are reducing that person to no longer be a priority, it's just getting it done and off your list is what you're trying to do. See, we want to make sure that people are the priority, not busyness, not crossing it off my to-do list, not money, right? Not too many things. I mean, that's just one of the things we've got to change. I mean, there's been too many Christmases, birthdays, anniversaries that have been opportunities missed because we're not focused on people. We're focusing on the wrong gift to give. See, when you give the gift of presence to someone, man, now that is a powerful gift. 
And watch what happens when it does. Watch what happens in your soul and then watch what it does for the someone around you. Uh, it was a couple years ago, Sally and I were over in Petaluma. Uh, we had had an appointment that we had over there and we were stopping and just kind of hanging out uh, for some time afterwards for lunch and just walking around doing a little shopping. And we stopped in Starbucks and I was just sitting down and she was up at the counter and she was over there for a while. And we were kind of observing and watching outside as we were going that there was an individual who clearly was homeless and lived on the streets. Uh, this gentleman uh, came into the Starbucks when we were in there and Sally was just kind of watching him and he went up to the counter and he ordered, you know, a, a drink and it looked like the people in the store knew him. And Sally's completely intrigued by kind of what's going on because they treated him pretty respectfully and clearly he was somebody who was from the streets and doing his best. I mean, he was on the streets, but he wasn't totally disheveled, but he definitely was living in a way that most of us wouldn't live. And so when Sally got up to the counter, she's so intrigued, she asked, she's like, hey, like, what's the story? Like, I just, I'm intrigued to know. And like, you know, he's like, hey, this guy, he comes in every single day and he's always polite and he always just has just enough money to order this one drink that he gets. And so he comes in and, and he orders it and he's always polite. And so we, the guy who's taking the order was like, hey, it's kind of sort of like kind of goes with the story. He's kind of part of it. Like everybody knows who he is. And of course, that said a lot about the workers that were there. And so Sally's touched by all this and his story and how he's trying to do something and then how the workers are treating him. And so Sally was like, you know what? I want to do something for this guy. She's like, hey, in addition to my drink, would you get me a $25 gift card? And when I'm gone, would you guys go give it to him? Sally's like, you know, I don't want to be in the middle of any of this. I just want him to be blessed by this and give it to it. And so the guy behind the counter uh, all of a sudden tears up. And he's like, I, like, nobody does this kind of thing anymore. That was his response to her. And he's like, hey, you know what? Here's your free drink. And he gets the card. Sally and I were outside and she went off shopping. And I stood there and watched because I wanted to see what happened. And sure enough, the guy walked over, was explaining to him. And you could see the look change on this man who was living out on the streets, his face. And see, that's the power of presence when you do it. And that just means, you know what, in the moments that we're in, it doesn't always have to be this great magnanimous display. I mean, we see something pretty incredible in terms of what happened here, but that's because it's connected to the divine. But when we respond and go, you know what, I'm in the moment that's going on and I just want to connect with someone that's in front of me and I want to help them the best that I can. This last week, uh, we had a banquet here at the church uh, for the cross country team and our head coach was up here and Sally came because she wanted to just be a part of some of the things that I've been doing over the last number of months and see who some of the kids are and whose names I mentioned. And our head coach was up here and he was giving out kind of awards at the end of the night and he gave out this award that was completely unexpected to a boy that you would not think would get an award. Uh, and what really struck Sally is she started to tear up because this is a boy that was not going to help the team in terms of excelling to its goals and getting ahead. Here's a kid though that got this gift of an award because he just worked hard and Sally goes, I didn't realize just how much investment, you know, the head coach put into a young man like that who's, who, who's had some challenges uh, just personally in terms of just his, just the way that he's wired and the way that he's made. And, and yet here's the coach clearly giving him time, clearly giving him his attention, and he's absolutely loving being a part of what's going on. And his life's going to be changed because of the attention that he is getting. That's the power of presence. And as followers of Jesus, we have to get this right. We have to understand that there is this power of presence that God wants us to give to the people around us. And it should change how we interact with and we actually give gifts to the people in our lives, not just at Christmas time, but the gifts of our presence that we should be able to connect with and to give value to and make sure people feel prioritized and loved and cherished and have a sense of we are here to love and honor you. Here's the thing. The way we give gifts, somehow we've traded the best story in the world for what's on sale. What can you do to give the unexpected gift of presence? Who can you give the unexpected gift of presence to? You have an opportunity. 
You don't have to come with something grand, but start with something meaningful. Start with something right in front of you. Maybe there's somebody this week that you could actually give that to. See, that's the, the beginning of the way that we can maybe give the unexpected gift of presence to someone. But in the story, it was powerful. The wise men gave that gift to Mary and Joseph. And they were completely blessed by what they had experienced when they met these men. But actually even more impactful for you, for me, for the entire world was the gift that the wise men received when they met Jesus. See, the unexpected gift of God's presence is the best gift ever. Matthew 2, 11 says, They entered the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and they worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chest and they gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. See, upon meeting Jesus, they responded in a way that was completely uncharacteristic of what you would expect. Of course, if you met a king, even a newborn king, you would bow out of respect for the place that you were going. But to actually get on your knees and to worship, that's an entirely different response. Now, did they fully understand who Jesus was, why he came to earth, that he was going to head to a cross and die and come back to life? No, they didn't know that. But there was something about the presence of what was going on in that room. There was something that clearly, unmistakably was like, God is here and they got to encounter that the moment that they met Jesus. And it began with the star. The star showing up and it was so extraordinary, so divine, so beyond what they could even comprehend should be happening that they literally go, wait a minute, this was also foretold? Think about it. Divine star and this was predicted and now it's happening. There is something that is going on here that is beyond our comprehension and our understanding. This has to be from Heaven, from the divine. So the gifts then that they gave, unknowingly probably to them, they were just kind of common gifts that you would give to someone of royalty. But the significance of the three that they chose would come to have huge significance, especially speaking about Jesus' identity and his purpose here on earth. The wise men didn't realize it, but giving these gifts would have great significance down the road. See, gold... That was a gift that was fit for a king. And of course, we know Jesus to be known as actually the king of all kings. That gift of frankincense was one that really was representative of deity. Just kind of the origin of what it meant was that Jesus wasn't any baby. He was actually the one true God coming to earth. And myrrh, myrrh was a powerful spice. It was used in burials. And at times of death, and it would be foreshadowing Jesus' death on a cross for humanity. Can you see the moment that was taking place of what the wise men were experiencing when they were encountering Jesus? It just spotlights the truth of who Jesus was. He was now God with us. And the wise men were some of the first to experience it, to see it. What an unexpected gift they received, the presence of being right there with God. See, that's why he came. Jesus came to offer us his presence so that we could experience it in our lives, to be connected to God once again that had been separated by sin. And so in coming to earth, Jesus was going, you know what, by my life, by my example, by my sacrificial death on a cross, that's the only way that you can have a connection so that you can be in God's presence fully, completely, once again. And the wise men were able to get a taste of that, that day that they met Jesus, that they were in God's presence. See, anytime you encounter God's presence, anytime you meet Jesus, you're changed. Nothing is the same. When you experience that, and the Bible tells us in so many places, like when you meet God and you kind of encounter him and through the person of Jesus Christ, like God's presence is revealed to you. It's why the Bible says God is actually with us. He is present with us. And you can have his presence in your life today. You just have to believe and you just have to ask. You have that faith and courage and all of a sudden the presence of God comes into your life. Honestly, that can just be through a simple prayer. 
That's the beginning step. It's not the only step. It begins pursuing and living this life. Honestly, it's kind of what we see from the wise men. They continued, went seeking after this child and followed. That's the path that we need to take in our lives to have the presence of God in us. See, when you pray a prayer like, God, I believe... God, I want to know that presence in my life because I know that on my own, you know what, I just feel disconnected. I get caught up on so many things and I make so many wrong choices. But with you, God, it changes everything. See, we need to acknowledge that we need God in our lives. We need to acknowledge that having God's presence in our words and in our thoughts and in the choices that we make and the directions we take and the decisions, the responses that you give to your wife or you know, the presentation that you make to your clients or, or how you lead the, the crew at work or navigating the ups and downs of friends or school or your future. God loves it when we come and we respond to him because we've encountered his presence and it just transforms us and changes us. See, God loves it when we give him our presence, just like the wise men did. See, that's the power of actually unwrapping Christmas and this unexpected gift of presence. See, people love it when we give it to them. You need it from God. And God longs it when we just come and say, I want to be a part of being in your presence and I want to be with you and I want to prioritize you and I want to let you lead my life. See, when we do that with our time and when we give back to him through generosity and when we go to his word and we, we talking to him, serving to him, singing to him, these are all ways that we can say, God, I want to prioritize you. That's the heart of what God longs for us, what he did in coming to earth. He simply wants us to respond in the same back to him. See, the wise men showed us the way to start. Bow down and worship. Bow down and worship. With a sense of worship and what it's talking about here is just maybe how you spend your time and how you treat people. Maybe spending some time in prayer, coming to church, watching online and going, you know what, this is a priority for me and it's a non-negotiable because I want this because God, you are the number one priority in my life. When you give first back to God out of everything that you bring in uh, over anything else, you offer God your presence of saying, God, because of your presence in my life, I want to give back so that other people can experience that as well. It starts to change you. Why? Because I think all of us long for a connection to the divine. That's why in our souls and in our lives, we're so fractured and broken until we get connected with Jesus and walk into his presence again. We're desperately trying to fix something that we can't, but when you come into the contact with Jesus, man, that's when it all changes. Give him your presence and you'll receive him. And that's what happens when you bow and you worship. It really comes as a response to one of those songs that we sing this time of year, O Come All You Faithful, when that kind of refrain comes in, it says, O come, let us adore Him. O come, let us adore Him. O come, let us adore Him, Christ the Lord. Today, I think some of you long to actually go, you know what, I would love to actually come into God's presence and experience that in my life. Well, today, you can. And when you do, changes the way that you respond to the people around us because when you experience God's presence man you just want to share that gift of presence with the people in your life and watch how powerful things begin to change in you and around you would you bow your heads with me Heavenly Father man your presence coming to this earth is powerful you being God with us really changed everything for all time. Because you were here to live a life as an example of just what, what does life with God really look like? What was the life that God originally intended when he made us supposed to be like? And by coming here and actually being in our presence, live and in the flesh, as God come to earth, we got to see it and hear it and watch it and to try to live our lives modeled after what you did and God then when you went to the cross to once and for all cancel out our sins the thing that really separated us from being in your presence fully and completely God that is what then changed it all but it started with the birth 
It led to a cross and then you coming back to life. And God, that allowed us to come close to you again. And that gift of presence, God, is powerful. Because when we experience your power, God, you transform us and change us. And I know that there are some people that are watching that are going, you know what, I need some change in my life. I've just gotten really superficial. Uh, I've just gotten a little distracted. I've gotten caught up on so many different ways and paths that I've missed out on going, you know what, I do crave in the depths of who I am to be connected to the God of the universe. His name is Jesus. And he loves us so incredibly much. And he says, when we trust in him, when we let him lead, that actually his presence resides inside of us to help us to make the right choices, good choices, God-honoring choices every day. And I pray right now that there's someone going, you know what, God, that's me today. I'm tired of my old way, and I want to walk in your presence today. God, I pray too that you would just begin to just come inside those and let their the feeling of relief, God, the feeling of joy, the feeling of peace in the very core of who we are begin to take hold in them. God, I still think that there are still others that maybe have trusted in you, but God, have gotten caught up on being a little bit less about showing your presence to those around us. And God, we've Sometimes this time of year, we can just get caught on a lot of different things for a lot of different reasons. We can get distracted away of going, you know what? God gave us the gift of his presence and he longs for us to be able to respond in the same way to those around us. God, I pray that we would be able to show that gift to others. And then ultimately, God, we would point back to why we act the way we do and why we want to show love and connection to others. And that's because of the presence we've received from you. God, would you change how we treat the people around us? So God, we just say thank you that the gift of your presence is powerful and it's the greatest present that we could ever receive. And I pray, God, now that we would walk with that sense of you with us every single moment of every single day of our lives because you said you will always be with us. And I am thankful for how that impacts me. I pray it impacts those around us, those that are listening. God, those that want to be transformed and changed by your incredible, unexpected gift at Christmas time of you coming to earth and giving us your presence. God, we say thank you. And in your name we pray, amen. We want to just say thank you for being a part of Thrive Online today. We are in the middle of this unwrapping Christmas series, and we have one more week to go in our series as we walk through this Advent series together. Remember, we're going through our daily readings in the Jotham's Journey book, uh, and you'll see this theme of an unexpected gift kind of work its way through, and Jotham had his own sort of unexpected gifts of presence and people helping him, his longing to get back to his family, and you'll see that throughout this week as you continue to read along with us in the story every day. Uh, And we wrap up the series actually next Sunday as we kind of conclude this idea of just the heart of what unwrapping Christmas and the true kind of core meaning of what it's all about. You don't want to miss it. If you miss some of the earlier weeks, I want to encourage you to go and check it out. Also, we want to just say thank you for those of you that give and are a part of helping Thrive accomplish its incredibly big mission. And we want to make it easy for people to find and follow Jesus. And for those of you that give and you give regularly, we are grateful for it. And so thank you for your recurring giving, your tithing. Um, One of the ways that we can give presents back to God is honoring him with the very first and best of what he's given to us. Maybe you've never given before. But you're going, you know what? I really do feel like God has spoken to me through what they've experienced with Thrive and I wanna make sure I give that back. Uh, And I would love to help others experience it. Would you consider going, you know what? I wanna trust God and I wanna give back to him. And would you give a gift uh, to Thrive to be able to kind of support the mission of what God has called us to do here? We would greatly appreciate it. And there's some incredible things that God is doing through our church. We have gifts that we're giving to a local homeless shelter program. There's actually 29 kids right now that are in a homeless shelter program and we're blessing them with some incredible presents this year and you get to be a part of helping us do that. We've given Thanksgiving meals away. We've given over a hundred coats to a local elementary school recently. 
There's some incredible opportunities of what God has done through our giving and you get to be a part of that. There's a lot of ways to give. You'll see a link that's there. And we just wanna say thank you for it. Uh, and we are grateful for what God is doing through our church. We can't wait to see you back next week as we get ready to wrap up this series. Remember two weeks from now, Thrive at Home is happening. We'll get you more information about that next Sunday about how we want to help encourage you to have Thrive in your home that day to be a part of what going, you know what, I want to have church and we're going to kind of put it into your hands to lead and guide your way through. And before you get a little kind of uh, kind of like, oh, I don't know if I can, you can. It's an incredibly rich, meaningful time. So there's some great ways that we're finishing out this year and we can't wait to see you back next Sunday as a part of Thrive Online.